going to get started today and uh, hopefully get you through this in good order today. Welcome to our three-hour dealer education class. We are, um, uh, the, this is the second of the classes we have uh, put on and the last one lasted just a hair over an hour. So we're hoping to keep that within the uh, prescribed time. Uh, thank you for those of you who are um, in person and online today. We appreciate your, um, your willingness to uh, learn more about your industry and be uh, and get your credit for your three hour education class. Um, all of you who are online should have received a download of the class. Um, if you didn't, if you'll just uh, hit the chat button and send a note to Shannon, she can resend it to you. We will be going through all the pages of that today and get you uh, through this in good order. Uh, my name is Wayne Jones from the Used Car Dealers Association of Utah. Uh, we've, uh, I'm the executive director and we've been uh, providing these education services since the inception that was passed a little over 20 years ago, if you can believe that. Um, so I hope you'll uh, accept my apology that I'm sitting down today. I tweaked my back a little bit this morning, so I'm gonna stay seated so I don't uh, uh, aggravate my back further. So thanks for your patience with that. We're gonna start today by uh, with a couple of pieces of information before we get into your book. One is once we complete the class today, you will, uh, we will have the information to go online with the state uh, for you to renew your license. Unfortunately, the state is not having access to the portal for your renewal, nor us putting in our three hour education class until tomorrow. And uh, so if you uh, want to get in on, um, on the uh, portal on Monday to renew your license, that should be soon enough for you to do that. Uh, we will have our information from our end on that uh, to begin with uh, starting in the, uh, as I said, starting on Monday. So um, having said that, we're going to start with our, um, with our uh, class today in your book. Um, inside your front cover of your book, there's a new tech service that the association has implemented uh, through the Used Car Dealer Association. This is going to be a new tech service, just text Utah Dealer to the number that's there. This is going to be specifically for um, any questions that you may have during the course of the year or as you're changing things within your dealership that you can text that and get an immediate response to the um, to the uh, any questions you may have in, as far as compliance is concerned. Um, so put that in your phones, keep it handy, give it to your staff, anybody who needs uh, questions answered. I've had uh, several today just from our class that we taught Thursday of people who were inquiring back and it works very well. Over on the next page is the table of contents and the things we'll talk about today. And then also remind you on the next page that uh, IDS of our title service, there's been a lot of difficulties with a lot of dealers and title work during our COVID experience. Uh, everybody's, uh, everybody kind of smiles when we say COVID experience and the things that have changed. Uh, on Roman numeral page five, this is our welcome letter and a couple things I wanna mention to you. We hope that you'll feel like this is a class that doesn't just simply fill a requirement that this is the reason why we have education to help keep you out of trouble with your consumers and with government. Uh, one thing I will say is that the legislature is always looking at ways to regulate us. And that's why we as an association need to exist and help help do that. We've been on Capitol Hill for a lot of years to be able to represent the dealers. I will remind all of you that I am not an attorney. I don't profess to be, nor do I want to be. But because we deal with the law a lot, a lot of people will, a lot particularly dealers and their staff will call us concerning issues that have arisen with their dealership. If you have specifics to your dealership, make sure you contact your legal counsel for that. And, we're, and you're welcome to have them call us if they have any questions as well. But we also hope that you'll be invested in your uh, industry. And because we have an association and we have people who pay dues, this is why we're able to do what we do. Over on the next page is our antitrust statement. Anytime we have people together, even online, uh, because we can communicate, we always put our antitrust disclosure out there that we don't talk about things like price fixing or boycotting or any of those other types of things. Across the pages, our information on our copyright. Uh, this particularly with our forms, we have some new forms that we'll be talking about today um, that uh, will help you in your uh, disclosure to your customers. Uh, please uh, don't take our forms and copy them. It is a violation of the law and it's never a comfortable day for me to have to call a dealer or a printer and ask them why they're copying our forms illegally. <clears throat> that also applies to uh, online forms as well. Over on the next page on page Roman numeral eight is our locations for the association and IDS. Uh, 
in, in uh, uh, Midvale, Ogden, and Orem. And we hope that you'll, uh, if we have you have any questions, you can come to our uh, offices to get those taken. We've also put some resources down there for you because many times a lot of leaders have questions about specific things. And even as it relates to what my disclosures ought to be as far as insurance or legal issues, uh, we put down some uh, contact information for the Vernon Insurance Group. Uh, they're here and going to make a small short presentation today about some things that have come up during the past year that you will want to know about. But also it gives you um, in the uh, left-hand column there, uh, if you have reported problems through the Motor Vehicle Enforcement Division, uh, we uh, ask you to uh, call them. We're happy to work with you on that as well. We have a great relationship with Alan Shinney, the director of the Motor Vehicle Enforcement Division. And uh, we are, um, are always willing to help the dealers and their any issues they may have with motor vehicle enforcement. So before we get into all the bills today, we are uh, going to, I'm gonna introduce uh, Vic and Vince today from the Vernon Group. They're gonna bring up a couple, two or three things that have come up during the course of the year. I went tweak my back a little bit, so I'm staying seated today. Mm -hmm. So one of you can get on e either side of me and they can still Great. see it just like last time. Thanks, Wayne. Uh, so I'll just sit here as a, a prop or something. So. Uh, but I'm going to give them a, a, a minute to uh, talk about some of the things that have come up this year, and um, it's all yours. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Wayne. Thanks for having us down here. Uh, thanks, Janet, for doing this. Um, how important it is every year you, when you renew your insurance policy, you go over it with your, your agent. There are so many changes that happen. First thing is your dealer plates. Next thing, employee changes, your inventory or your locations. I can't stress or emphasize the importance of that, of the agent not contacting or you not contacting your agent on an insurance review. The second thing I wanna talk about is having a, a safe place for your keys and titles. When we, Victor and I, when we go into businesses, every time when we open the door to walk in, right here are the set of keys. Please be smart about it. Put your keys away in a safe place during work and after work. Um, also, when you go on test drives, how give the person one key. We had four thefts last year of having duplicate keys and giving them out for a test drive. So please take note, have one key for one test drive. The other one we have is uh, test drive agreements. Uh, it's kind of a coin toss depending on the dealership that uses these test drive agreements. They have them, but they don't use them on a regular basis. We recently had one that went down here this year where uh, a customer had come on in, went and test drove a few cars, and after the third car, he didn't come back. And unfortunately, the test drive agreement was being implemented. The, uh, the dealer that was involved got very lucky that there were no significant damages when the car was recovered. Most situations, or a lot of situations, when the car is gone, there's going to be some significant damages that take place. And ultimately that test drive agreement is here to protect you as the dealership um, with that scenario. So please, please, please use those test drive agreements. Um, the other item is being a member of the association. So there's a lot of benefits about being a member of the association, one of which you get 10% off on the insurance through our programs through Vernon Insurance. Um, we can talk further about that later on, uh, but there is a laundry list of benefits about being a member. We highly recommend those that are involved with Community to look into becoming a member of the association. So, so, Thanks, Wayne. so you're telling me you shouldn't just give me both keys so I can put one in my pocket and give the other one back to you? We've come seen back, it happen. Come back that night and take the car? Not during the night, Wayne. It can go but, during the day, too. We've that, seen that should be a chapter I should add in my book. I should write that. Yes. <laughs> great, Thank guys. Thanks for your time, guys. Have any, a great day. Does anybody have any questions at all before we send them on their way? You good, Shannon? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Great. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you being okay, here. Thank okay. you. Okay, thanks. Uh, just for your information, the association has the test drive agreements available for you, and making those, um, uh, make sure you uh, are using those as they mentioned. Um, if you refer back to your book, thanks, guys. Appreciate you being here. Thanks, Wayne. Um, if you refer back to your book, we're going to move on through your book. Let me just mention a couple things. All the information that is in your book is not a complete text of all the bills that were discussed. Uh, that are in your book this year. Uh, if we did, the book would be hundreds and hundreds of pages long. We put the pieces of the legislation that specifically apply to you with the changes that were made. Uh, 
And so uh, if you do want to have a complete text to a bill, make sure you go to le.utah.gov and you can print out the whole handout. When you look at them and when you look at different uh, uh, scenarios in our handouts, you'll see that there's some language that has a line through the words and there's also a line under the words. Anything that has a strike out through the words is uh, words that have been deleted from the code. Anything that is underlined are words that have been added to that. This year's session was unusual, just like everything else has been this year with the COVID going on. Um, this is the first time in my 44 years that I went to the Capitol one time this year. Everything else was done by Zoom or by some kind of uh, communication link. Um, the nice thing is, is that we were able to still communicate with legislators and be able to have the impact we needed to uh, review the bills and discuss those with legislators. And because we have those long-term relationships with legislators, we were able to get a lot of good work done this year and we'll walk through this this year. Uh, the um, legislature, uh, even though it was uh, restricted by COVID, uh, still passed over 500 bills, which is a little less than normal. Usually they do about 525, but it was only 502 this year. So it was a little less uh, number of bills. Uh, if you ask me, the fewer, the better. Always in my case, I always agree with that. Um, but uh, there are some this year, we were, weren't so concerned about things that pass as we were things that we kept out. And we'll talk about those today. Every year I have kind of a favorite bill that I has, has kind of a new, an unusual name. And this year we're gonna talk about it because it provides a real opportunity for the association and its members to get some help. So if you look on page one of the bills where on the top of the page, it says bills passed. House Bill 217 is called the Regulatory Sandbox Program Amendments. I love the title of that. It reminds me about being a kid playing in the sandbox, right? And so the nice thing about this bill is that it is an entrepreneur bill. What this bill allows is that the governor's office is going to put together a, an advisory committee for all business. So if there's business entrepreneurs out there that want to do something and government code is restricting them from doing that or causing problems to do that, they can act and have approval by this advisory board to do like a test or some kind of pilot to make sure that this will work. And it also provides a way for consumers and businesses to make suggestions on why we still need some of the antiquated laws and why we uh, need to make sure we review our laws and regulations on a regular basis. So I see this bill as a real opportunity for our industry if there's things that we want to do outside of the normal box of, that we operate under. And that box is pretty big with all the different government regulations in it. Um, uh, we, it gives us that opportunity for us to do that. Now, all of these bills we're gonna go through today, if you look in the bottom right-hand corner, page one, it shows you when these bills go into effect. There's uh, basically um, uh, upon the signature of the governor, a date specified in the bill, like the bill might say January 1 of the next year or October, whatever it is. Uh, but most of them go into effect 60 days following the session. And 60 days following this year's session is on May 5th. So on May 4th on the news, you'll hear a lot about new, all these new laws are going to go into effect. Into effect. That's when most of them are, are going. So as we go through this, let me just, I forgot to give instructions for those of you who are online. If you do have a question, there is a chat icon on the computer screen. If you will just click on that, it will allow you to type in a question that you may have, and Shannon will be able to give that to me. We won't be able to put you on speaker here, at least not yet. We're having some uh, technical things we're working out with that, but you can ask that question online, and I will repeat the question so that everybody can hear what that question is. So feel free to chime in, and I will ask if there's questions as we go along. Yes. They also can use the Q and A function. Yes. Also, there's a Q and A function on there that does the same thing on there. You can click on that and use that as well. Okay. So moving on to page two, uh, House Bill 170. This bill came about because if you remember last fall, uh, the DMV decided that they were going to end uh, the distribution of the cards for renewal for um, people's renewal on their vehicles when they came due. Uh, there was a lot of, the reason they did that is because they were trying to reduce budgets and, and costs because of the impact of COVID and other things. As such, the bill went, this bill actually changed a lot during the, before it was written. And this bill started out as if you want to get a notice, you can notify the DMV, but you'll have to pay a fee to do that to have the notice sent every year. That bill morphed into this existing bill, which basically puts 
everything back into place, but what it does is add a provision for uh, an individual to be notified electronically. If you remember on the new uh, vehicle application for title, there's a section up here that I highlight in yellow here is between the owner and co-owner for an email address. So if somebody wants to get an electronic notice, they need to make sure they put an email address on there. So your action item is gonna to be to let your employees know that if your customer wants to get their notice electronically, you need to make sure you fill out that email address on the application. So the notification will still come through the mail or you have a choice to do it electronically. And uh, even if you do it electronically or through the mail, there is no cost back to the consumer for doing that. The next bill on the bottom of the page is a vehicle boat and trailer registration bill. Uh, this has to do with um, the automatic renewal of a vehicle. This will allow, and again, having the email address on the application will allow an individual to notify the tax commission that they want to set up on an automatic renewal of their vehicles that they own. If a vehicle is subject to an emissions test, which is what, still one of the requirements on certain model years, they will be required to uh, have an emission test and have the and, and also submit that to the tax commission before that renewal, that automatic renewal will take place. So uh, be aware of that, train your employees. You may have questions from your customers about that just, or maybe a, a great added incentive and a great way to inform your customers on how they can make that renewal very easy every year. Um, and then uh, that, that not only applies to motor vehicles, but also off highway and, and all, all those vehicles are registered. We will be getting more out of the tax commission as time goes on with that. On page three is a vehicle registration checkoff fee. This, this bill actually did two things uh, that, um, uh, that, uh, that changed in the code as far as registration. If you remember on the application for title, there in section four down here, there's a couple of things. One of them is you can check a box to contribute to the off highway vehicle fund, the friends for sight or the or organ donation program. This bill actually changed some of that to include and will include this. And if you look at the effective date, it won't be till January. So you don't need to change your vehicle applications yet, but the, on the new application in before January, it will include that check off the new checkoff is for emergency medical services and search and rescue. Those are two new lines that will go within that line that are coming up. The uh, second part about this is um, uh, on leased uh, and sold vehicles. In the past, and, and this is a good example of a bill that was uh, instigated by a, by a consumer, by a constituent of a legislator, they had leased a vehicle and paid all the appropriate fees for title and registration. And then the person decided, well, I decided I don't wanna really lease it, I'd rather buy it. So if they do that within that first year period of when they paid those fees, the fees will now be transferred from the lease to the purchase without any additional cost. And so that's the two things that this did. Um, and it applies basically to the taxes and fees that they'll still get credit for. That way they won't have to pay that, uh, those, those taxes and fees again when they change it from a lease to a purchase. On the bottom of page four is a motor vehicle repair amendments. If you remember last year, there was a bill passed that dealt with the advanced driver assistance on a vehicle. Those advanced driver systems are things that are like when you're going down the road and, and it allows you, it, it warns you when you wander out of your lane. Those are advanced driver assistance features for safety. Some of those are incorporated into a windshield. And last year, legislation was passed that if a windshield was replaced and that system was not restored, that the windshield repair facility was required to notify the consumer that it was inoperable or not working. This extends to dealers also that if you're selling a vehicle and you have knowledge that that uh, advanced driver assistance system is not working that you are required to notify the customer. We have developed, this is one of the new forms that we have put together so that if you have a situation where you have a vehicle that the driver assistance program is not working, uh, you can give them the form and say, hey, it's not working or it hasn't been calibrated. You can take it to, and, and so be careful with windshields that you've had put in, make sure that they have been recalibrated. They're typically recalibrated by either the glass company if they have the capacity or if not, they can be done by the new vehicle main, uh, dealer manufacturer, whoever carries that line. 
Uh, it also includes in this bill notifications that if insurance is paying for windshield replacement, that there has to be uh, an electronic or a hard written copy given to the consumer and whether that, um, um, whether there is a cost or a fair cost associated with doing that. And then with most bills, there's a penalty associated for people who are not uh, complying with the law. So that covers that through page six. Any questions so far? If not, we'll move on. Page seven. Uh, this is called the Road Usage Charge Program. Uh, this is a special revenue fund. So where this, you may have heard in the news or in comments around something called the RUC, R-U-C, RUC. That stands for Road Usage Charge. That program is in place right now that allows a person who drives very few miles to be able to pay their use based on the miles they drive. And they may be able to pay a lower charge for their registration fees than what the standard registration fees. I always refer to grandmas, but maybe you have a car sitting for a long time that you're not putting a lot of miles on, uh, whatever the case may be, they would also qualify. The only thing this bill really did this year is change that money that is collected under the RUC to be put in a special fund. In the past, it was put in the general fund. This money in the general fund it was supposed to, and is used for improvements in the roads. So when they do, uh, just like they do with the gas tax. And so this will provide a separate fund for transportation. The legislature is trying to separate out the money that is specifically dem uh, being collected for road repairs and road improvements in a specific fund rather than just having it all go into the general fund and, and part of it getting lost or not being used for the purpose it was set. So there really isn't any action you need other than to inform your customers uh, that, um, that there is this program available. And I believe in the future that uh, there's gonna be more on this, particularly as we have more electric vehicles on the road. If I'm not, uh, if I drive an electric vehicle, there is also a difference in registration fees. That was for compensation for someone who is driving an electric vehicle, not paying gas tax because they don't go to the gas station to fuel their vehicle. So that money that's collected there will go into the uh, road usage charge of the RUC program. Over on the next page on page eight is emission testing amendments. This really only applies to Utah County diesel vehicles. If you remember last year, they started a pilot program to see how well this was gonna work, adding the uh, diesel vehicles to the emission testing in Utah County. This bill actually, all it did is amended it from a pilot program to now being permanent. So that schedule that there is for those diesel vehicles in the Utah County area will be, um, uh, the pilot program goes away and it becomes permanent. On page eight, it talks about bills not passed. So those are the bills that we talked about. Those are bills that passed already. And a lot of them had to do with registration on that. One of the things we have um, a great interest in every year is, is making sure that there are bills that are not good for our industry. We keep them from coming into law. This year probably was, um, we had two big issues this year that were really important. And the reason why we have an association, if we're not there, things like we're gonna talk about next are gonna things that are just gonna go through and dealers are gonna to have to live with. So the first one, which had no number on it, it was called the dealer fees amendments. And you would look at the title of that and see, well, you know, what does that really apply to? What this, and I mentioned this over the last several years, I told the dealers there's gonna be a bill to regulate dock fees. That's what this bill did. If you look down about the fourth or fifth paragraph from the bottom in paragraph B, it says, a dealer license under this chapter may not charge a documentation fee that exceeds $150. Now, certainly there's probably dealers that charge less, but there are some that charge more. If you remember from our conversation before, um, and this is really important in, in the conversation, in our conversation before, we referenced this dealer doc fee sign that is required by statute. If this is not familiar to you, you need to make sure you get this. You can get them from the association, but you need to post this sign in any sales area that you're talking with your customers as it relates to doc fees. Okay. And I, I'm sure you can't see the language on there, but you all should be familiar with that. You'll also see on there that I highlighted the words and profit for there. Doc fees cannot be a profit center for a dealer uh, because of certain court cases that have just taken place. Because of the type of fee that it is, you can only charge what your costs are. So to help you through that and understand what your costs are, 
the association has put together an Excel spreadsheet that includes the right things. And you may need to make sure you don't have the wrong things on this. You can make your own if you want, but we have gone through and made this available for our members that you can just go through an exercise in an Excel spreadsheet and plug in the numbers. And when you get through with the exercise at the bottom right hand corner, you're gonna know what your actual costs are for your doc fee. So we hope that you will uh, evaluate your doc fee. This bill came about because the legislator went into a new car dealership and the new car dealership did not have the signs posted. The dealer knew what the doc fee was when he was told by the F&I guy um, and he didn't wanna pay that amount. So he said, I'll still buy the car if you eliminate that. And the dealer said, oh, we have to charge you that because that state mandated. Now that statement is clearly against the law for a dealer to say, my doc fee is a result of, of, uh, of government uh, and they require us to do that. So make sure that you are doing your process correctly. Make sure that you are posting your doc fees. One other thing I asked him is, how did you come up with $150 for that? And I said, so let's, let's uh, not pick on dealers. Why don't we just say anybody who charges a fee that would include attorney fees, attorneys can't charge more than $150 an hour. Let's, let's just include everybody. Well, the seeing that he was an attorney, he didn't like that idea very well. And so I said, well, let's not pick on the dealers and, and isolate them with this. And uh, as we went through, uh, this was something that he agreed to pull and not do because we already have everything in place that uh, covers the doc fee and the disclosure to the customer if the dealer does it right. If the dealers do it right, we will not have legislation like this come up again. The second part, uh, the second bill that in fact, the same legislator proposed based on his experience with the same car dealer had to do with dealer duties and disclosures enactment, kind of an unusual title again, probably because he's an attorney, nothing against attorneys, but that's kind of how they are. So this had to do with whether a dealer is acting in the best interest of a consumer. If you remember uh, what the, let me just back up. One of the, what, what this bill actually does is says that uh, this bill will actually create a private cause of action. If you look at page 10, about halfway down, there's paragraph two, almost right in the middle of the page. It says a dealer acting as a broker. And by the way, a broker is a broker. Nobody can be a broker in Utah, but he used the word broker for the F&I person that's in the F&I office. But they, interesting in paragraph B, it says that the, uh, Agent owes a fiduciary duty of the utmost care, integrity, honesty, and loyalty in dealing with the consumer. And I said, that's what dealers do because they are creating a relationship with their customers to make sure that that takes place. But this bill ultimately said that if a dealer offers financing, they have to give the lowest rate to the consumer and they have to show all the, all the different finance companies that they are making an offer to for what the rates are and, and let the consumer choose what it is. Now, him not understanding the process that it's not just about interest rates, it's also about how long a term you need. It also relates to your credit score. And sometimes you may pay a little higher interest rate based on your credit score or because you um, need a longer term. And so one of the things that we reminded him of is that in our contract to sale, if you remember here on the right-hand side, there's the finance disclosure section of section A and section B. You're gonna have your customer sign section A if the customer is doing the financing themselves. They can go to the bank, they can get it out of grandma's mattress. I don't care where they get it from. If they're gonna bring it to you by the due date of that amount that you're gonna put in line 31 there, then you're gonna have them sign section A. Section B had all the things that we're already doing that he put in his bill, we are already doing here, which means if you are gonna arrange the financing, you're gonna disclose a range of interest rates based on the information you get, how long a term, uh, how um, much your down payment is and so forth. And also further, this goes further to say that if you can arrange the financing, the customer still has the opportunity to go get their own financing. So make sure you do your section A and section B carefully. You're either gonna have them sign one or the other, never have them sign both. It uh, causes contract violations if you do have both. And remind you that if you can't do the financing, you have seven days to send them a letter, say, sorry, we can't do your financing. You either bring the vehicle back or you can go get your own financing. So any questions about that? Any questions, Shannon? Nope, we're good to go. Okay, great. Um, Motorboat Agreement Acts on page 12. Oh, wait a minute, I just missed something. 
turn too many pages. Uh, page 11, power sport and marine bills. I'll go through these quickly because I know we don't have any many off-highway vehicle persons, but basically what this bill is, and probably a personal interest to a lot of you, has to do with children who operate off-highway vehicles, power sport equipment. In the past, there's been a limitation that said, if you're not eight years old, you can't ride one yourself. So this legislator who has grandkids said, hey, I have small machines. My kids can reach the pedals and they're trained. Why can't they drive them? So that's what this bill does is it eliminates the under eight, age of eight restriction. And if you look at the underlying language, there's a couple of provisions they have to follow. One is they're able to reach and operate each control necessary to safely operate it. They have to possess, this, possess the safety certificate. So if they go through and take the parks and recs test, they have that, they're issued that certificate, they have to carry it on them. It can't be on dad or mom or back at camp. They should be carrying that with them. And then also if they're 16 to 18 year olds, they don't have to take the safety course that they choose not to if they have a valid driver's license, then that would also uh, come into effect. If you turn over to page 12, the one thing this does not allow the, the uh, youth rider to do is to uh, operate a street legal all-terrain vehicle on a street. So if they're street legal, you're not gonna get an eight-year-old kid riding those out there because he has a safety certificate from Parks and Rec. So it does not apply to street legal vehicles that are operated on the street. Under uh, House Bill 314, this is a motor boat, motor boat Agreement Act. This has to do with uh, those who sell uh, power boats, motor boats. Uh, this is similar to a franchise act, but it puts some provisions in there to protect marine dealers and their manufacturers, just as it does with RV dealers and new car dealers. So I'm not going to get into that. We've had a number of meetings with the uh, motor boat dealers. If you have specific questions on that, let me know. It does not apply to used motorboats, only to new. And as a used car dealer, you're allowed to sell used motorboats. On the bottom of the page, there's a couple of changes, natural resource uh, entities amendment. There's going to be a major change in parks and recs and Department of Natural Resources on changes in their structure and uh, applying for grants and other things that are taking place under uh, parks and recs. One nice thing I saw in the um, in the uh, power sport stuff was that there are going to be two new state parks. We are really in a shortage of Utah in having places for people to camp and go. As you look in the uh, left-hand column, there's two new state parks, the Utah Raptor State Park, which is out in the basin, and the Lost Creek Park, um, which is up toward the Morgan area, I understand. On page 13, it wouldn't be a year at the Capitol without new license plates, right? So we're gonna add more decals to our drawers. The first one is really a change from the cancer, uh, specialty cancer plate. There was a lady uh, whose name was Allison Gamble. She worked at the Capitol, was admired by a lot of people. She passed away last year from cancer and as a tribute to her, they changed the uh, organ donation uh, piece to her. And then also there was a uh, Qantas plate now. Uh, Kwanians got together and said, we need a Qantas plate. And then on page 14 is the jazz plate, if you will. It's called the Men's uh, National Professional Men's Basketball Support Team Support Bill. Because of the change in ownership and, and the jazz, uh, there needed to be some statutory changes in that. And uh, so that will, that's just an administrative piece. So one of the things we're going to do as an association is we're going to make a new recommendation. Uh, to the tax commission is to privatize all the specialty plates. We think government should get out of the business of supplying and paying for and distributing all of the specialty plates. So one thing that we'll do is open it up to any organization if they wanna have 15 decals for their specialty plate. The state, all they would do is issue the right kind of plate that has a space for the decal. And that organization would go to the tax commission and say, we want a decal. They have to meet the tax commission the standard for what that decal can and cannot have on it. And then let the organization print it, let the organization distribute it, and then give that to people and the people can put their own decal on. From a selfish standpoint, that will eliminate three drawers of decals in our title offices. And it will also eliminate a lot of costs for the state to distribute all those decals that go on uh, throughout all the many, many DMV offices. Um, a couple other bills, if you remember on your uh, application for title, there are three default plates, uh, the uh, arches plate, the ski plate, and the In God We Trust plate. <clears throat> there was a proposal to add two more to that list. They're listed in your book up there. One of them was a dark sky plate. Utah, a lot of areas in Utah are being deemed as national uh, dark sky areas. And so a legislator who was a 
uh, quite the astronomer kind of guy. He wanted to have a dark sky plate. And then one with uh, Pioneer history wanted to do a Pioneer plate, uh, keeping with the uh, background from our state. Those two did not pass. So those will not be coming and there should be no changes to those. One of the things I wanted to talk about was a couple of future issues. One of the things that we've been working on as an association for about a year and a half now and coming up almost on two years is we have voiced our concerns that we are sending approximately between 1.2 and $1.5 million in premiums that dealers pay in bonds to have a bonding program. And our bond claims are down sizably from what they are. So there's a lot of money going to insurance companies. We feel that a lot of that money can change and stay in the state if we revamp our bond, uh, dealer bond program. The way we're gonna structure this is it's gonna keep the protection for the public uh, that if a dealer fails to deliver title, that there will be money to be able and probably be able to have more increase in money without increasing the face of the bond. The other two parts of this that we think that money will be available for is one, for dealer education. Uh, be it for training in the dealership or with our three or eight hour courses. If we put this program together, it will provide a way for education for you as a dealer to be free. So you could come to all our classes for free. And then the third part of this, the third leg of this stool is on new consumer education. We feel that the smarter consumers are and the more informed they are, the better it is for a dealer and not having confrontation with his customers. And so we are looking at putting this program together to begin a new consumer education program, which obviously from our standpoint will really enhance of why a consumer ought to buy from a used car dealer. Um, all this money will be uh, controlled through the state. We think through a somewhere between two to four dollar increase in the temporary permit will eliminate the premium you're paying on your dealer bond and will still generate probably a million and a half dollars to accomplish all that. So we hope that the dealers will support this uh, cause and what we're doing together it will save you a ton of money. It will also bring great credibility to our profession and help consumers be uh, more informed on their purchases and keep you informed as well and eliminating a lot of the costs that are associated with that. So that, that concludes a lot of the stuff we talk about legislatively and what we're currently working on. The next section here has to do with some rule changes. When the legislature passes, and this starts on page 15, the legislature passes a law that says, for example, a dealer can't do deceptive advertising. Instead of putting all the things that are included in deceptive advertising in the code, the tax commission implements a rule that says, here's all the list of the things that you can't do in advertising or that you can do. And so there are two sections that apply to motor vehicle and the association and the governor's advisory board, which we help participate in, reviewed a lot of these. And this is the draft that we put together. Sometime this spring, there will be a hearing at the tax commission to hopefully adopt some of these. And we hope that we'll get your input on this as you read through this. So the first page doesn't have any really changes on that, um, uh, but it has to do with decals on vehicles. In fact, if you turn over to the top of page 16, there's a housekeeping change because it says the current decal shall be placed over the previous year's decal. Well, uh, you know, if I have a car that's 10 or 15 years old, I'm gonna, technically I should have 10 or 15 vehicle decals that I keep sticking over the top of the old one. This actually says that you can actually be in the place of, so I can take out my old ones. It's just a housekeeping piece. The next section is if you're in the impound or towing business and it deals with impound yards, uh, one of the things that we're clarifying in that is in the middle of page 17, it says in that paragraph, just uh, paragraph A, where those highlights are, an individual, an individual who has ownership in a vehicle, and this clarifies who has ownership in a vehicle. It says a person listed as the registered owner or leasee of a vehicle, has possession of the vehicle title, or is the registered lien holder of the vehicle. So those of you who do buy here, pay here, many times it's been difficult to get in to see a vehicle that may have been impounded. You, this will clarify that you have an ownership interest and legally an impound yard has to let you in to be able to see that car before you uh, take any action concerning that car. Over on page uh, 18 deals with uh, odometer disclosure. And this has to do with uh, uh, the um, uh, disclosure on branded titles and so forth. And we're tying that to 
what the federal statute is. So every time the federal statute may have a change, we don't have to change it in our statute or in our rule. On page 19, this R877 proposed rule, this has to do with section 413 of the Motor Vehicle Code. This has to do mostly with licensing and titling and so forth. This talks about temporary permits. Um, there's just some housekeeping things on the first page, but on page uh, 20, uh, again, these are how uh, dealing with temporary permits and for example, audits. I'm sure if I had everybody raise their hand who had a problem with an audit this year or paid a penalty because they hadn't matched up the, the uh, license plate with your temporary permit, there was a lot of money paid in temporary permit violations this year. I know of one dealer who uh, dealership who uh, paid in excess of $100,000 in temporary permit penalties. Uh, we have actually put together a program for dealers who need help with their temporary permit audits. And I can pretty much guarantee you we can save you the money for those penalties that can be incurred. If you uh, go over to page 21, it talks about on the bottom of the page on the advertising. This is always one. And, and from here on out, I put little checks in the advertising of areas that typically dealers are fined with that you need to pay particular attention. First of all, it defines at the bottom of page 21, what is a uh, advertisement and that includes anything, uh, business cards to ads on TV or and anything in between. And so it talks about um, uh, advertising violations. Um, it, uh, for some of the dealers, if you're advertising a picture of the vehicle down on the bottom of the page, uh, the advertisement has to contain a picture of something that is quoted on a price it has to be similar model and similar option accessories. So you can't put a different looking vehicle for the one that you're offering that's substantially different. Where a lot of dealers are getting in trouble is on top of page uh, 23, which deals with the price. When you advertise the price of a vehicle, uh, that price has to include, and if you look at the bold language at the top of the page, it's the price you must pay for a vehicle, including freight and destination charges, dealer prep and dealer handling. If you have those charges, you have to put them in your ad if you're advertising price. If you're not advertising price, you don't need to worry about it. Uh, it also in the rule says what does not have to be included in her, and that's in the next paragraph, things such as a dealer dock fee, uh, charges, undercoating and rust proofing, their charges, not fees, but rust proofing charges, and dealer prep and handling, um, um, and any county taxes like and registration fees, those do not have to be included in the advertisement. Further down the page, it talks about savings and discount claims. This is the was priced at, now priced. Don't use those on vehicles or in your ads. Uh, those are uh, covered in this as well. Uh, top of the page for down payments. Remember that if you have a down payment, you're not gonna refund it. You have to disclose that to the customer before he gives you the down payment. And we have a down payment disclosure form. So guy wants to take a, uh, uh, test drive a vehicle and see if it'll pull his boat to Lake Powell and be gone for a week. If you decide you don't want to give him his uh, down payment or deposit back, then you have to disclose that to the customer before you accept that. Uh, in the middle of the page, it talks about the phrase, we'll pay off your trade no matter what you owe. That not only is the state uh, statute and, and covered here in the rule, but it is also federal law that you cannot do that as well. If you turn the page, and, and some of this applies to new car issues like demonstrators and so forth. Over on page 26 is using the word free. The best advance advice I have on that is just don't use the word free in any kind of an ad. And then on the bottom page is fine print. Make sure that it's uh, legible and easy to read. If you advertise prices that include a lease versus a sale, then you need to uh, make sure that it's identified as a lease. On the bottom of page 27 is a rebate offer. And I always ask the question, can a used car dealer offer a rebate? And the answer to that is, yes, they can. They just can't offer a manufacturer rebate. So as such, if you're going to offer a rebate, like the next holiday is what, Memorial Day, let's say. If you want to do a promotion for over Memorial Day and say, hey, we offer a uh, Memorial Day rebate of $300, you can do that. You can offer a rebate. Just make sure on your contract to sale you cross out the word manufacturer and just put rebate and whatever your rebate offer is. If you look at um, signs and decals, I'm not gonna mention anything on page 28 or nine, those are mostly housekeeping things and practical things that make sense. On page 30 talks about the dock fee that we just talked about earlier. This issue that we highlighted in the dock fee of and profit has to come off this sign because of the court cases that were determined. So once this rule is adopted, 
and that's where this next section on page 30 covers. It eliminates the word costs and profit in this. So keep using this form until we inform you the rule has changed. Once it's changed, we will provide to the members without the words and profit for there. So you'll have the correct uh, documentary fee sign on that. Again, make sure you post those so people know that you're charging a fee if in fact that's what you're doing. A couple of changes on form disclosures. Uh, the new 656 form is available. The change that's been made already is this piece up here that deals with the email address. Uh, that has already been changed and we have those available. Uh, there's also for your information, we have worked out for many long hours with the New Car Dealers Association, a new contract that will be available exclusively through us for the used car dealers of a retail contract. As you can see, this is a terribly long form and this is a good reason the reason this form is what it is is because of the laws that were passed federally and truth and lending and attorneys wrote it. And so it has a lot of information on the front and the back of that. Because of the increased costs with our current uh, carrier of the form that we've been using, we are now changing to this new form. It will be much less expensive for you. Those are available now. You would have to do, they're different uh, than the other ones. So you will have to do a computer change. If you decide to use the new ones, we will have limited supplies of the old form available. And once they run out, we'll be transitioning to the new form. And this would be for buy here, pay here dealers, or, and this form will be used by a lot of the finance companies. So if you're using subprime financing, many of them are gonna be moving to this uh, new form. Um, also the uh, plate change choices on the, which will be around January, those will be available um, around the first of the year. Last couple of items I want to mention is on page 22. This is a federal change. We've been working with the uh, federal government from our National Association, Association. Effective this year, there is a change on the odometers and the odometer rule that was just implemented and went into effect January 1. What the odometer change mentions is what vehicles are exempt from disclosure. Currently, it's 10 years, so a model year 2011 typically would be exempt. Next year, 2012 would be exempt. Now they're moving from 10 years to 20 years, and they're implementing this a year at a time. So that means this year's 2011, if you look at the chart on page 33, you can see all the 10-year exemptions starting in 2011. You're going to continue to disclose the mileage that's no longer exempt. Uh, 2011 model vehicle will be carried on till January 1 of 2031. That sounds like a heck of a long ways off, but it'll be here before we know it, right? So uh, that will come. And then 2012, you can see each one of those 20 year disclosures will carry on until we have them, until everything is on a 20 year exemption uh, from a 2021 model through January of 2041. And that is a long ways off. Over, and so that uh, that you will want to make sure you do if you have older vehicles you're dealing with that are 2011. And then again, next year when 2012s, those will not become exempt. You will still have to do the odometer disclosure. If you want a lot of the details, we have a uh, fairly succinct and descriptive uh, program of how that works through the American Association of Motor Vehicle Administrators that provided that information for us. Uh, last thing I will mention to you is also on branded titles. And one thing I didn't mention that I missed in the advertising rules is to make sure when you advertise salvage or branded vehicles that you disclose those in your ads. That has to be included in the ad after year, make, and model. Then it has to say branded vehicle or something similar language to that. You cannot hide the title brand disclosure in the, in the description such as um, power steering, power brakes, branded title, custom wheels, so on and so forth. Um, also, when the enforcement division does their inspections uh, or comes by to see, or who come by to see you in your dealership, they will ask if you have any uh, branded vehicles for sale. If you say yes, they're gonna say which one, they'll go out and they will check for the salvage disclosure form that should be disclosed in the vehicle, can just go inside on the dash, but it has to be clearly visible to let the consumer know that it is a branded vehicle title. Now, what we have done is taken and updated the new language that happened last year and have a new tax commission form. This can be downloaded on the tax commission because it's tax commission 
form number 814, and it has a new disclosure based on the new language that was implemented last year. If you have the old ones, you're gonna probably be okay, but I would highly recommend that you do this. There's no cost for those unless you uh, buy those in duplicate copy from uh, IDS. But again, make sure you do the new salvage disclosure if you have a vehicle that's on your lot for sale that has a brand title or salvage. Last couple of pages are membership. We can't do any of this stuff without uh, your help. And boy, we've gone through the class really fast today. We're under an hour, probably because there have been fewer questions this time. Uh, last page is on membership application. We can't do this uh, job without you. We All we're asking you to do is to hire us for about a dollar a day to be your advocate with all the different entities at the Tax Commission and Public Safety, the Department of Commerce, Motor Vehicle Enforcement, all these and the Insurance Department, all these different entities that have jurisdiction over there. We're your representative to do that. Those of you who are members of the association, a lot of you have been members over the years and we appreciate your support because without that, all of this stuff that we were able to keep out and all these changes that sometimes don't make sense and you wonder where these guys get their ideas from, all of these things would be going through because nobody would know and there would be nobody there to represent you. So if you're not a member or you know somebody who isn't, uh, grab a membership application. There's one in your book. Feel free to copy that to give to anybody you like. It has a lot of the member benefits and, and things that are available there, not only through our state association and IDS, but also through our national association. And one way to be able to pay for the whole thing is uh, uh, talking to the guys from Vernon Insurance. One thing I found over the years is that we need professionals who understand things and insurance is a good example. Dealer insurance is many times a very unique situation for um, what coverage you need and making sure the coverage is adequate and protects you like you need to. The nice thing about the Vernon companies, these guys know their stuff. They know what you need, what you don't need. They will help you find ways to save money and not have coverage that you don't need. So feel free to call them. So Shannon, um, before I conclude, is there any questions? I don't have questions? Okay, I hope I did a good enough job. There's no questions, but again, that's why the association is here, whether you're a member or not, please feel free to call us if you have any questions concerning that. I will remind you that uh, your credit for the class and you registering for uh, the uh, renewal of your license should not be done until Monday. Every other class after that, you could go right in, but this class and the one we did Tuesday, you're gonna have to wait till Monday uh, to do that. We are also, if any of you are doing it the old fashioned way, and are not doing it electronically, if you get us, and this goes to any dealer to renew your license, if you bring us down here to IDS, if you'll bring us a copy of your insurance coverage page and your copy of your dealer bond, we can do all your renewal for you. For members, we're doing that for $10, and for non-members, we're doing it for $25. So if you don't wanna be hassled with renewing your license, come down to the office or send those to us, and we will have a uh, authorization form for us to be allowed to do your renewal for you with the tax commission. And we'll be able to do that for a very minimal amount. So if that's a hassle for you, let us help you with that. And also, if you have any other questions with this, feel free to follow up with my staff. Uh, call the office, the numbers are in your book here. Uh, thanks for being here. This class lasted 55 minutes today. Is that good or what? Great. So thank you for being here. Anybody have, else have any questions, comments, or otherwise? If not, have a great day and thank you again for uh, coming into our class.